So that's where I don't know how. It's my preview. Mm. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so we are going live with day two of our painting together. And for today, day two, um, I'm going to be moving from, I'm going to be working on charcoal for a little while. And then after charcoal, I'll be hopping over to uh, laying in with a really limited palette. Um, probably start with burnt umber for a bit. And then after I'm working with burnt umber, I'm going to switch over to a limited palette. And I'll be explaining all these things as I go. Um, a few people wrote to me and asked that I begin the lesson a little bit differently. So I'm going to do that today. So this tune um, is so old that they actually can't place it. They believe it's a Celtic tune and it goes back centuries, if not millennia. And later on it was set, the words were set to it. Um, I think you'll recognize the tune and I think it's a beautiful tune just given the, the day and the time that we're in. That'd be a fun way to begin today. Um, and with that, we're just gonna jump right in. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take you over to my palette and I'm going to show you at my palette the charcoal that I'm working with um, and then I'm going to also show you um, an innovation that I had with a mall stick. As I get down to detailed work in the face, one of the things that I like to use is a mall stick. Um, this is my travel mall stick, otherwise known as the pole of a pop-up tent. And so it's nice, it's carbon fiber, it's lightweight, and it's about, I think, I got it for about $30 on Amazon. And a carbon fiber tent pole is really great for when you want to get exact information and detail, because as you lean into the drawing or into the painting, sometimes you want specific work in certain areas and you need to lean your hand on something. So again, this is very lightweight and I really love working with this and I keep it with me all the time as I set out to work. So going over 
to my palette right here. What I have on the left is really thick charcoal. Um, that's from Cornelison. And Cornelison is a store in London. Um, I highly recommend it. But you really don't need to just go with Cornelison. Grumbacher has some really great jumbo sized charcoal. That's the charcoal on the left. And then on the right, it's just some studio charcoal from uh, Vlick. Uh, I'm going to be painting right over this charcoal, so I don't need the best stuff out there. I'm just keeping it really simple for right now. So again, I'm jumping right back into the painting, and I'll be talking about materials in greater depth later. shoulder and the left tire. One of the things that I was talking about the other day is so much of this pose consists of the conflicting angles. So the slight tilt of the head uh, this way contrasts with the tilt of the shoulders. So there's one angle going this way, another angle going that way. And I really like the way that that breaks it up. If I didn't have that conflicting line right there, just kind of like opposed against each other. And let's say for a moment, the head were straight on and the shoulders were square and it was perfectly vertical, perfectly symmetrical. Um, there would be a severity in that. There would be almost something uh, imposing. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you have to know when you do that, that that's the effect that you're going for. Um, so I do not want painting my 12 year old son to make it look like a mug shot. I want, he has a way, an inquisitive way of going through life with a tilt in his head and I really enjoy that. Um, he's, I'm flattering him here, but he's always filled with curiosity and wonder and his ankles are always itchy. No, I'm only kidding. Um, he's always filled with curiosity and wonder and so he tilts his head all the time and that's just something personally that I look for in a painting. If you look right over here, you'll see that he wrapped his arm around that, the arm of the chair. It seems like a small thing, but for me, it's not a small thing. Little details like that make a painting. They're these little idiosyncratic touches that somehow define a person. I wouldn't have sat like that if I were him. And the reason why I sat, I have that, is to pull out aspects of Liam's personality Again, this whole charcoal sketch is gonna be wiped out, so I don't want, want to put an excessive amount of work into it, but I definitely do want a groundwork, uh, almost like a foundation. Back in the day, I was pretty opposed to laying in, in charcoal first, and then I changed my mind as I went along because I saw a really beautiful black and white photo of Soroya, S-O-R, O-L-L-A, and Soroya was painting his wife, Clotilde, and in that painting, in that portrait, uh, there's a huge charcoal understudy, and I'll try to share that image online with you guys to show you how Soroya would lay in these massive paintings, some of them were like six, seven feet tall, and he would lay them in completely with charcoal before he even put brush to canvas. For me, when I saw that image, I was struck by one thing. I was struck by the fact that Soroya is among the most painterly artists that I know of who ever lived, and that his work is highly expressive, a lot of gorgeous, lush brushwork. But if he could start with a really solid drawing, then I could as well. So now here's something that I do that always hurts a little bit. This is a nice new piece of charcoal, but it's not of great use to me when it's brand new and unbroken. So some pieces I'll do that. It could break your heart to do that because that's an expensive piece of charcoal, but that's of much greater use to me at this stage.
Now I'm looking to lay in the biggest masses. I just want to map out big, broad swaths of information. Again, I'm more so suggesting things and just laying a broad foundation than I am going to great specifics all throughout the figure. However, I will go into quite a bit of detail in the face for the simple reason that I want to get the shape of the face. I want to get the shape of the face really locked in before I start going in with paint. One of the most important tools when I begin a drawing or a painting is a paper towel. So paper towels for me are as much a part of the painting and drawing process as is the additive substance. So if this is additive, it adds, and this is subtractive, it takes away. The one is as important as the other. So I do a lot of shifting work and blending with just a regular paper towel. that Liam is sitting on is pretty important to the composition. Um, I'm playing around with a few different options. I could put it exactly where it is, or I might intentionally flatten the perspective, or deepen the perspective, I should say. Um, so I'm going to see whether I'm going to tell the truth, or if I'm going to tell a bit of a slant, slanted truth right here um, for the surface that he's sitting on. I wasn't intending on putting this curtain into the composition, but I kind of like it. Um, and somebody wrote in yesterday to me and said that the curtain was a nice touch, and so it might make its way into it. If you want to see a really beautiful background, and again, I'll post this in an upcoming feed, but a really beautiful background in a portrait painting is by Cecilia Bow, and it's a painting of a man with a cat. I forget his title. Uh, but it's, it's pretty well, widely known as Portrait of a Man with a Cat. And I'll show you a beautiful background in a portrait painting that's very uh, surprising because it's just really a mass of pulsing abstract shapes that represent a background in a painting. Sometimes people ask about backgrounds in paintings, and I think the thing is, if you look at your hand and then you focus on your hand, you notice that the, everything behind your hand falls out of focus. I think our backgrounds oftentimes can follow that rule. Where if I look at Liam's face, that curtain behind him actually falls out of focus. And for the charcoal drawing, that will suffice. For the background. Just a simple indication. Now, I'm jumping over to the smaller, more precise bits of info, uh, more precise tools for more precise information. So, I want to break this about right there. And then I'm going to grab my mall stick. Again, my mall stick right here, just a tent pole made of carbon fiber. And then I can lean on that mall stick in order to get really precise, bit, uh, precise information. So, as I look at Liam's face, and then Liam, if you can turn a little bit right there, a um, little less tilt, a little less tilt right there. Um, I'm, as I'm studying his face, I notice that I, I want to get more precise with the lips. And so to get more precise with the lips, I'm going to grab an eraser and I'm going to really chew into the uh, charcoal drawing. Again, this was my eraser earlier, just a piece of paper towel to smooth things, but now I need a sharp needed eraser, 
well, not sharp, but maybe made to a point. So I'll be back in a moment. <laughs> So what I do now is grab this kneaded eraser, just pull it a few times, and I bring it to a point, just like that. And getting the kneaded eraser right to a point, I'm then able to dig in. So, let me see here. No. So I could never draw the information this precise. I have to, in order to get the information, in order to get his lips, I have to reduce, I have to go into the subtractive method of pulling away. The corners of his mouth matter greatly to me, and as I look at the corner of his mouth, I just want to be sure I study this with precision. Even though this is just a really big, broad drawing, I want to still be precise at this stage in certain areas. And what I'm doing here is I'm actually drawing a line, sorry Liam, from the corner of his tear duct down. I'm dropping a line down, and I'm seeing that the corner of his tear duct in real life is actually lined up with the corner of his lip. The corner of my tear duct is too far over. It's hitting the side of his nose. And that's not, that's not useful. I mean, that's not accurate, I should say. Um, that's gonna really mess me up in the future. So the whole entire eye can just get bumped over. And again, I do this with the kneaded eraser. A friend of mine, a sculptor, a really great sculptor, named Jar Jason Arkles, who you might be familiar with, he always had a saying in the studio, and it was, don't be precious with your artwork. Um, what he meant by that was, if you need to change something, change it. We shouldn't be reckless either, but he wasn't implying that. What he was saying was, if you see the change, if you line something up, if I'm looking and I'm dropping a line down from here and it's landing all the way over at his nose, that's wrong. But if I drop it from here and it lands right there, perfect. I almost liken that to a musician really trying to get the right note. And I am not a great musician, I'm not a, a professional musician, I am an amateur musician, but I know when I hit the wrong note on the violin that my audience's shoulders cringe and go up to their earlobes, and that means that I have to correct that decision quick. Um, this is of the utmost importance right here. If the eyes are off at this stage, it's gonna be a whole lot of trouble from that point forward. So now I, I'm looking and I think that the eye is possibly coming down a little bit too far. So I'm just gonna nudge it just a little bit. This is never gonna be that accurate in charcoal. Again, this is a groundwork. The thing about this painting, some portraits are not about the eyes, some portraits um, can emphasize anything from the ears. Some portraits can emphasize the overall position, the hunch, the gesture. Um, different emphases for different artistic purposes. But this portrait is very much about Liam's eyes. So if you notice now, this is feeling a little bit down. It's not a problem at all. This is part and parcel. This is part of the process, I should say, of just laying something in. I shift things around quite a bit at the early stage, and I, I'm not too hard on myself, but I allow myself, almost as if this is wet clay, I allow myself to keep shifting stuff around.
And that's feeling much better. So then if you could turn your head a little bit right there. That feels a million times better to me. And as I stand here, I'm gonna bring the side of his face over here out a little bit more. And this side of his face, I'm gonna bring in a little bit more. Again, I'm gonna use this to chew back with information subtracting. It's as much a part of creating an image to subtract as is the additive component. Whether that's brushes, pencils, charcoal, doesn't matter. And tilt your chip right there. Chin up. Right there. I keep the ears very broad and angular at this stage because I move them. And so one of the things I can see is that I drop the ear too low right here, and so it can come quite a bit higher. But I'm comfortable with continuing to shift all this information around a lot. Now I'm jumping back to my broad um, information. I'm just gonna quickly map out the general shadow shape on here, on his shirt. And that whole entire side arm right here can go into shadow. And the chair. Okay, well, that is about as far as I can take the charcoal lane of my uh, painting. And so at this point, I look like a coal miner. I'm going to switch over to my paints and um, I'm going to start mixing over at the table. So you can watch me as I just lay out some paints and describe which paints I'm using and why. Okay, so I'd like to talk about my setup here a little bit. I spoke about this briefly yesterday, but what I work on is a bench from construction and it's a telescoping legged folding bench. And I can take this with me when I go and do portrait commissions in people's homes. The palette that I work with is a palette from Zecchi in Florence. If you want to support Zecchi Art Studios in Florence, Z-E-C-C-H-I, and purchase a palette from them, I think they could use the business now more than ever. Then right here, our brushes all laid out. I'm going to be starting today pre probably mostly with um, my bristle brushes. So these are assortment of bristle brushes and I'll go into them in greater detail. And then that right there is my mega brush. It is my pride and joy. I've never used it yet. I just purchased it in London and brought it back home and I'm excited to use that. Palette knives all laid out, bag of paint down there, gloves, and I'll talk about these things in greater detail and a book about Thomas Jefferson and John Adams' letters and Abigail's letters to each other. That's just there because it's interesting to read about the American founding fathers in times of plague in London, in Paris, and Benjamin Franklin's in there, here and there as well. And it's just really beautiful to see how these people uh, carried on, even while there was great hardship and difficulty. So we're going to move all this to the side. The first
first thing I lay out is my burnt umber. This is Williamsburg burnt umber, and we'll try to straighten out the label for you. But Williamsburg is a fantastic handmade paint uh, that comes from Brooklyn. I keep all of my paint in a bag, as you see right here. And that's because I've tried every process of storing on the face of the earth. And I come back to the bag for one simple reason. It's light, it's quick to transport, and it's not cumbersome when I'm like outside painting or something of that sort. Uh, today, I will not be laying out many paints. Today, I'll be laying out very few paints. So I'm gonna keep it simple because I'm only probably gonna get to the shadow shapes and I'm not actually gonna work on the um, laying in the flesh tones. This is a tube of Old Holland ivory black paint. You're gonna to have to trust me that it's Old Holland ivory black. The label fell off and I just put a little bit right there. The next thing that I put out is a bit of Chinese vermilion. And the Chinese vermilion is one of my favorite, um, it's one of my favorite colors on my palette. And I like it just because it creates these singing flesh tones. And so this, this Chinese vermilion is made by uh, Michael Harding. And um, it hasn't been around that long, but again, I keep my brushes in a, I keep my paints in a bag so they can get a little bit beat up quicker than other artists. The next paint that I cannot do without is Naples Yellow. So Naples Yellow, again, Michael Harding, handmade paint. Uh, this is genuine Naples Yellow. And I put a little pinch right here. And lastly, I will put a bit of white paint down, but I'm not gonna be putting too much white down. This is Kremnitz White, and this, is, this Kremnitz White is from Old Holland. I always squeeze out my paints with my gloves on because I, no matter how careful I am, I always get it all over me. But if I wear gloves, I have nothing on me whatsoever. A quick note about laying out paints. As you see right here, burnt umber, ivory black, Chinese vermilion, uh, Naples yellow and Kremnitz white. I always put out my paints. Sometimes I have 17 colors out here, but I always put them out in the same order. And why is that? Well, the reason why that is, is because when I reach, when I play piano, if I reach for a note and it has moved, then that will result in me just being a little bit confused. Every single time I reach for a note, it's right where I need it to be. Same thing I feel as I paint with, um, mixing up flesh tones. Early on in the painting, I really want to always have all the colors in the same spots, so I don't even have to think. I reach for the note and it's there. I reach for the paint and it's there. Um, as I start out, typically what I do in the early stages is I lay out what's called a value string. Um, I invented the value string a while ago, and it was one of my moments of sheer genius and brilliance, where I figured out a way of laying light to dark, and I was thrilled with myself, and you know I was really proud of my originality. And then I painted with a bunch of other artists one day, and they looked over and they said, oh, who taught you the value string approach? Uh, so apparently artists have been doing this for centuries, and I thought I was all clever when I invented it. But what I'll do is I'll have this gradient in the beginning from a mid-tone, so right here it's Chinese vermilion, all the way to dark. And really for the first moments in painting, that's all I need. I don't really need much more. I don't need um, to have pools of, let's say like some blush of pink that's in the left temple of Liam's face. I don't really need that. More so what I need is just something to map out with as I lay down shapes and stuff like that. So this is what I use. Some people use cobalt blue. Uh, for this early stage. So I'm not saying you have to do this, but I just find this useful. So from mid-tone to dark, right here, you'll see this is turpentine, and I like genuine turpentine. Um, usually turpentine I get is either um, Windsor Newton or it is from Cornelison's. 
Robert Doak has a great uh, turpentine as well. And this is the Mayer medium. I'll talk about these things uh, in greater detail as the classes go by. So I kind of get like a bit of a soupy mixture going so that there's fluidity. Sometimes I'll touch it with a bit of medium, but not really on day one. I try to steer away from that. You want to keep your paint really lean on day one. So again, this is just nothing but mud right here, but I'm okay with that. So now with that, I'm ready to go. But what I might do before is get out the ultimate brush. You might touch it with a bit of Naples yellow. And now I have a nice ripple solution. So now I stand back here and if you want to turn your head, perfect. Now I start to lay in. And I flick my eye back and forth to look at Liam and then look at the painting. And as I flick my eye back and forth, it's really, really easy for me to get um, kind of like a one-to-one -one, uh, as he sits there and to really see where he, where, what, what his gesture is. I'm not just talking about facial details. I'm talking about the tilt of his head in relation to the axis of his neck. But I have to step back to see that. So if you notice early on, um, a lot of what I'm dealing with is that the charcoal is mixing right into the paint. And you could ask yourself, well, isn't that counterproductive? Uh, it doesn't matter. You have so much paint that will be going on here that the, the paint that's kind of like the charcoal that's getting absorbed into the paint, it will all just melt in soon enough. You won't notice it at all. Um, sometimes people ask me why I go with something like such as the hair early on. I don't really have um, an approach that says put the hair in first, but I look at the thing that visually is, has the greatest presence. So when I look at Liam's face, that huge mass of, of hair is a nice landing board for me, and it helps me to put everything else into context. I saw a beautiful painting by De Laszlo uh, the other day, it was about a month ago, and I was looking at the painting and I noticed how he used the hair to frame the little boy's face. That was at the Scion house. Uh, it was a painting actually of my friend's grandfather when he was a boy. So again, I am knowingly starting out this painting, putting in something that resembles warm mud. It's all going to get absorbed in the future. I really just need to map things out. And then once I map things out, I can start going to more specifics. I really love the color of the wall back here. And I, I kind of make mental notes as I'm working for things that I'm gonna look forward to. And so the color of the wall having this like pale, really cool, chilly tone against the warmth of his flesh. And there's like almost something like between Naples yellow and there's a touch of peach with light hitting in certain areas. And that's gonna look really beautiful one against the other. And keeping us company is our guardian, Tess. Right, Tess? Right, Tess? Tess. <laughs> okay, a little less tilt. So already at this point, I'm focused on the what we call the Van Dyke Z. So if you look up here, Liam, the Van Dyke Z, uh, 
as it's commonly held, is the pattern that runs on the upper side of the eyebrow ridge right here, down the side of the nose and underneath the nose. So it's kind of this one, two, three pattern. Um, I'm going to use that and rely on that heavily to land it's Liam's face. Uh, my teacher, Charles Cecil, wonderful teacher, would always say to us, the nose is the anchor of the face. The nose is the anchor of the face. I've looked for the origin of that phrase, and it goes back pretty far. I think it came from the French Academy, not entirely sure. Uh, it came from his teacher, who was Gamel, up in Boston. Um, and the nose being the anchor of the face, if you look at a lot of old master paintings, what you'll see is that a lot of those old masters um, use what seems to be the Van Dyke Z in mapping out the face. They used it as an anchor. So now I'm jumping over to a sable. And the reason why I'm going to the sable, uh, this is a Zeki um, Mar uh, Martora Kalinsky sable. And the reason why I'm going over the sable is I wanna get some of the softness of the facial features. So I'm just gonna mix in right here and just get something very, very soft, uh, very mid-tone, I should say mid-wing. Um, and I'm just going to bring in some Naples yellow. And so this is on the lighter end right over here. And so I'm gonna jump in. There are no really harsh shadows on Liam's face here. So I don't wanna use that harsh dark mud that I put down on the canvas. So I'm going to go in with more of a mid-tone, just like that. And I'll even start mapping out the whole half of the face with this. Now I think you'll see the reason for why we lay in with, uh, we can lay in with charcoal to really map out the broadest shapes because I can fill in this area quickly and really move forward with the painting with more confidence. So again, I'm not putting in any really harsh shadows. If you look at his face, the contrast over. right there is really, really low. What's that? If you trip, I'm going to look like a pirate. <laughs> Liam says if I trip while I point to his eye, he's going to look like a pirate. Um, so I'm really trying to keep these transitions low. We're actually seeing that the transitions are low. I don't want to go with real high contrast transitions because those will be very hard to undo at a future point. Now, as I'm working, one of the things I'm paying the most attention to is the broadest possible shapes. I'm not at all in the territory of being able to say, um, I'm gonna go into real specifics anywhere. Um, so accordingly, what I do in order to see the biggest possible shapes and to not see the specifics is I'm closing this eye and I'm using my dominant eye. And with my dominant eye, I'm squinting down greatly and if you do that, if you practice this, and you look across at a field with 100 trees in it, and you close one eye, and then with your other eye, you just squint, you can reduce everything to the, the most basic elemental shapes where it can't go any simpler. That's how you want to start out a painting. Um, it makes us look, us representational painters, it makes us look really uh, silly as we work, because we're always going like that. Um, but if you start out and your eyes are wide open and you're looking at the little glint of light in the corner of the eye with the eyelashes, uh, it really uh, does damage to the overall effect of the, of the painting. And so you want to, as best you can, keep your focus broad. Um, you want to start out, as the saying goes, with brooms, so really wide brooms, and you want to wrap up with Q-tips. So big, broad decisions then small decisions at the end. So one of the things I can identify is that his face is feeling a little long. And so 
already by staying broad, I can address that by going in and start nudging. So I'm gonna start nudging shapes here. And if you look over here, the, the color I've mixed up, again, it's just mud at this point. I'm really not so concerned with the singing color tones or anything of that sort. There's a beautiful reflected light coming off right here that has this like cold color to it. And I won't focus on that at all because right now his face is feeling too long and his chin is feeling kind of like uh, manly. Uh, so I have to really, instead of focusing on that beautiful color, I got to move the chin up. And now I have a little boy back. Chin up, lad. Chin up, lad. Chin up, lad. I think I'm going to squeeze out a little bit more vermilion, which will require me to get my gloves on. And true to form, it's going to take me a minute to find. So again, I'm only working with Naples Yellow and Vermilion at this point, nothing else. And I still have it pretty soupy. Okay, Lee. And turn this way. All right. Time limit. Yeah. We're right at the time limit. Okay, so that is our second 40, 40 something minute broadcast. And thank you, Liam, for sitting for me. Um, so, with um, the quarantine that we're all going through, what I'm going to be doing is every day at one o'clock. I'll be posting another 40 minute segment here on Facebook until things change, whenever that might be. So um, it's my hope that with all this, um, that it's a way that all of you guys can get your mind out of the news and just thinking about other things, even if it's just for a short period of time. And uh, if you have questions uh, on this video feed, you can keep on, I believe you can keep on uh, posting questions and right after this video feed ends, I'm going to hop on Facebook and answer any questions that you guys might have. A lot of people prefer to send me messages privately uh, through Facebook Messenger. That's totally fine. So uh, thank you guys. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Thanks, guys.